Hi, John here from the Historic Game Shop to discuss the board and other games played in the 17th and 18th century. Before we look at some of the games that were being played at this time, I want to mention some of the important sources. Francis Willoughby's Book of Games, known only in unpublished manuscript form until its posthumous publication in 2003, was written in the 1660s. It is a wonderfully comprehensive study of board, dice, tables and card games, and the source of some of the games described here. Another contemporary publication is The Complete Gamester by Charles Cotton, published in 1674. This is a survey of card and dice games which has, as well as the less desirable cockfighting, also archery and racing. Tables boards are common in works of art as scenes within inns and alehouses become favourable subjects. Jan Steen, in his painting of 1665, Argument over a Card Game, depicts this scene with a typical large and very sturdy tables board in full view, and this is typical of the type of boards depicted. The game of backgammon is first known from 1645, though it is a variant of early games and thought to be faster and more exciting. There were four levels of winning. A player bearing off their men before their opponent is a simple win, which is improved by bearing off the last men by throwing a double. A greater win is by a player bearing off all of their men before their opponent has bought off any. This is a gammon. And a backgammon is when a player bears off all of their men before their opponent and completing this in throwing a double. This game proved to be an improvement over all other games on the tables board and over time in Britain became the one people played to the exclusion of other games. The tables board became the backgammon board and 18th century varieties took on all sorts of forms including the box variety illustrated by caricaturist Thomas Rowlandson though this was painted in the very early 19th century. As we saw at the end of the Tudor period, chess begins to take on the characteristics of what we would recognise in the modern game. A chess set illustrated by Augustus the Younger, Duke of Brunswick Lundberg, writing as Gustav Selnus in his Das Schach oder Königspiel, the chess or king game, published in 1616, shows a king and queen each with a series of tiered crowns, the queen a little shorter than the king, the rook as a turret, the knight as a horse's head on a low pedestal, and the bishop as a form halfway between a symbolised elephant and the bishop's mitre, if that can be imagined. This set gave rise to many spindly and highly ornamented sets of the 18th century, typified by the many tiered crowns on the kings and queens. These kings and queens have their origin in chess sets in Germany in the mid-16th century, but these were, at this time, accompanied by the late medieval forms of rook, knight and bishop. The castling rule in chess was introduced in 1640 in Britain, with other rules that make up the modern game following through to the end of the 18th century. I have made a video looking at the history of chess pieces from the earliest form in Europe to the set published by Gustav Salinas in 1616, which goes into greater detail. Nine and three men's morris are as popular as ever, with the other great survivor from the medieval period, fox and geese, taking on greater interest. Despite being played most enjoyably throughout the later medieval period, pitting a single fox against a gangle of geese, the game is difficult to balance. The fox is playing a war game, capturing the geese one, two or three at a time. The geese are playing a blocking game, trying to prevent the fox from moving. With two experienced players, the geese should win. Initially in the 17th century, the geese were prevented moving backwards and from using the diagonal lines. Now the game favoured the fox and two more geese were added. Then a double fox and geese board was introduced with 31 geese and two foxes and later a triple fox and geese board with 49 geese and four foxes. Essentially, asymmetric games are difficult to balance but fox and geese has been enjoyed by many since the 14th century and the balancing of the game depends on who is playing as much as the number of geese and foxes on the board. An interesting variant dated to the 18th century, originally from Germany, though variants are played across Europe, is a salto. This is played on the original fox and geese board with two officers occupying a fort comprising the top square of the cross. There are 24 renegade soldiers attempting to occupy the fort and ousting the officers, though they can only move sideways or forwards, diagonally or orthogonally. 
The officers, both move in one turn, can capture the soldiers by the short leap and move in any direction. The soldiers win by occupation of the nine positions of the fort. The officers by the elimination of sufficient soldiers to make the occupation of the fort impossible. The huffing rule is also in play, meaning that if an officer is in a position to capture, then he must. Failure to do so results in his removal from the board. The soldiers can win by huffing both officers. The transition of the fox and geese game to Assalto has been said to represent a move from the rural interests to military in the 18th century. However, asymmetric games pitting one or two against many on reticulate boards where the many have to block and the fewer have to eliminate the many are numerate and have all sorts of themes, rural and military. The hare game of the medieval period, described in my video on 14th and 15th century games, pops up again in the late 18th century with a military theme called the soldier's game, pitting a renegade soldier against three others who are out to capture him. The rules are no different, with the same starting position and the renegade soldier winning by getting to one end of the board and his captors winning by forcing him to the other end. At the very end of the 15th century, or at the beginning of the 16th century, the game of Alkirki evolves into drafts when played on the then much more common chequered chessboard. Alkirki disappears quite rapidly and the game of drafts is adopted, though the rules take a while to settle down. The game is essentially the same, men move forwards and not backwards, and capture is by the short leap. But there are two important differences. The board allows for there to be two empty rows between the two sides, rather than the single unoccupied position, which has an impact on the strategy of the early phase of the game. Secondly, the men who get to the eighth row opposite their starting position are promoted to kings, allowing them to re-enter the game and move in any direction. This allows for a game of two parts, first the battle to promote as many men to kings and then the battle between the kings. The huffing rule, whereby it is mandatory to capture the opposition men otherwise you lose the man that could have captured, was at one point such that a huffed player would lose the game immediately. This late 17th century rule was thought too severe and abandoned, though the usual huffing rule persisted in competition rules until the second half of the 20th century. Discussion over the rules took place not only in Britain, but on the continent, where the game evolved differently. The outcome was a game of 10 by 10 squares with 20 men on each side, in four rows of five. Promoted men have the ability to move over many squares each turn in a straight line, and also have to change direction after making a capture. This is called the long leap, differentiating it from the game that evolved in Britain, which uses the short leap. The game, known as Continental Drafts, or Polish Drafts, Poland was thought to be sufficiently exotic to have originated such a game, was for a short time played in Britain, but English Drafts, as it became known, was eventually preferred. The English game is also referred to as Short Drafts because of the short movement of the promoted men. Continental Drafts is also known as Long Drafts and has many national variants and is also the game that is used in international competitions, so is also known as international drafts. The Long Lawrence was a form of long dice. In fact, these are Britain's only indigenous long dice, though many other countries and cultures have long dice for playing board games and dice games. The Long Lawrence was used for playing the popular game of put and take, which has been played using a teetotum in the 16th century. The four long sides have on them one line, two lines, nothing, and a side with lines and crosses. Each of those playing place a penny in a pot and in turn roll the long lawrence. The one means take a penny out of the pot, two means put another penny in, the blank side means do nothing and pass the long lawrence to the next player, and the side with the lines and crosses allows the player to win the whole pot. The game then begins again. In the 19th century, a more rollable eight-sided version of the Long Lawrence was made, though only a few examples survive. The most popular dice game of the medieval period was Hazard, a gambling game with three dice. This undergoes a few changes and in the 17th century appears with just two dice. The basic mechanics are similar and the gambling nature unchanged. Lead dice, hammered down from musket balls, are found in the 17th century around the period of the Civil War. 
Also, the standard pattern of pips on the dice, with opposite sides adding up to seven, is more common than not in the 17th century onwards. In the early part of the 17th century, playing cards were still being imported from France, though in 1628 imports were banned and British printers were forced also to become card makers. They based their design on the French cards they had been familiar with, though the court figures are less flamboyant and less richly dressed. The cards set the trend for British playing cards for several hundred years, and because they had the suits, hearts, diamonds, clubs and spades, of the French cards, and later Britain had a worldwide empire, the world now has these suits on most cards that are now printed. There are some fascinating suit symbols from other European countries dating from the 16th century that still survive, including leaves, books, swords and bells. The card game Noddy, an early form of what became cribbage in the 1640s, had its score recorded on a Noddy board, played to 31 points, later to turn into the larger cribbage board. This is described by Willoughby and must have been in use after the invention of cribbage, though probably does not survive the end of the 17th century. Troll Madame, which I mentioned in my video on Tudor games, is mentioned in Willoughby under the name of Nine Holes, with the rules to a simple game whereby three marbles are rolled and the scores above the holes that the marbles successfully go through are added together. Highest score winning. Willoughby is keen to add that the marbles bouncing off the pillars between the holes do not score. It's quite likely that other games were also played. Finally, dominoes, which are made mention of just a few times in the 16th century, are mentioned and found more often in the 17th and much more widely in the 18th century. Though originally from China, many finds are of European origin and were used to play gambling games, mathematical puzzles as well as parlour games. I hope that you have enjoyed this short video. These games, as well as many other board games from the Romans onwards, dice and playing cards can be found on our website.